As early on as the Gold Commission in the early 1980s, even up until now, I still believe that the best way to go from one system to another is to try to allow the market to help us. Um, we, you know, the British made a serious mistake when they tried to go back on the gold standard in the 1920s at an old uh, ratio of, of the dollar to the pound, and it uh, obviously failed. Of course, it was blamed on the gold, but not on the, trans the policy of transition. So the market has to help us on this. The market has to help us if we ever want to relate our currency to gold again. But I've been fascinated with some of the work of, of Hayek and others that talk about allowing currencies to compete with one another, let the market sort it out. And it's, it's a lot less threatening. Uh, other countries are talking about that. The, uh, the Mexican uh, government has talked about it. The, the uh, Swiss government has talked about just allowing other currencies to circulate within, a, in, within their own country. And when you think about it, isn't that what happens internationally all the time? I mean, currencies fluctuate all the time, and that's one of the ways that they were able to keep the system together is allow the competing uh, currencies to fluctuate on a minute-to-minute -minute, uh, basis. So there's no reason in the world that we couldn't adapt to allowing competing currency within our own country. And then if people just love uh, Federal Reserve notes and want to spend Federal Reserve notes and save in Federal Reserve notes, let them do it. But others who might think that uh, another system is better, uh, I think we ought to talk about 
legalizing it. To me, I like to summarize and say, why don't we legalize the Constitution? And the Constitution has been rather clear. Uh, it might not have given us the perfect monetary system, and we didn't follow it very well, but uh, at least it did indicate that the founders didn't like paper money. They did not like emitting bills of credit. They did not like fiat money. And uh, if, if we were to look just to the Constitution, it would mean that we should reconsider commodity money, something that governments can't control, can't monopolize, and let the market work. So those are basically my thoughts on this issue. So I'm anxious to hear the remarks from Dr. Parks and Dr. White on these issues because they've studied this uh, for many, many years. And, uh, and, and there's still a lot of questions to answer. We do have a bill, H.R. 1098, which is far from a perfect bill, but it's, some, it's a place to get started in talking about what we might do and how we can do it, because things could change rapidly. Uh, although many of us have been thinking about this for many, many years, uh, things could move rapidly. Currency destructions, the end of currency, sometimes move much quicker than everybody dreams uh, that it could. So a major crisis could come. It could come next month or next year or in a few years. It, but it, it, to me, it, it, there's no guarantee that we have five or ten years to keep studying this. I think that we need to get people engaged in this and talking about and understanding the monetary issue. So I am very grateful to our, our two guests coming today and being willing to submit their uh, remarks and uh, answer some questions for us. So I will go to uh, our, our first witness, uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Park, is the executive director and founder of the Foundation for the Advancement of Monetary Education. Dr. Park has studied money for 30 years and was a student of the free market economist Murray Rothbard. His writings have appeared in The Economist, Pensions and Investment, and The Washington Times, among others. He has authored and produced over 200 educational videos on the U.S. monetary system. Dr. Parks is a member of the United Association of Labor, Education, and UAW 1981 AFCIO. He received his Ph.D. in operations research from the Polytechnic Institute of, of New, New York University. And Dr. Parks, uh, go ahead and proceed and give your uh, summary, and uh, then we will go to our next witness, Dr. Parks. Push your button, please. Try that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Paul. It's a great honor to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to Hold clarify. Hold that a little bit closer to you, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, you. for inviting me. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of H.R. 1098, the Free Competition and Currency Act of 2011. I'm honored to have been invited. Now, I know it must sound like hyperbole, but I believe that H.R. 1098 is perhaps the most important piece of legislation ever to come before the Congress, because H.R. 1098 is necessary to make a transition from a certain catastrophic collapse of our unauthorized by the Constitution, dishonest and unstable legal tender irredeemable paper ticket electronic monetary system. Well, I suspect that this committee will be most interested in how this bill will affect jobs, debt, economic growth, and capital markets, pensions, and a host of other important and timely topics. I'm going to focus my opening statement with an example of the dishonesty, which is the Achilles heel of this system, of the present system, by highlighting one of the many misrepresentations about our money. There are three takeaway points from my testimony. The first is that this system is not in conformity with the Constitution. The second, and very importantly, it is dishonest. And thirdly, it is unstable and in the process of blowing up, perhaps while I'm testifying here today. One can be certain of a complete collapse of this monetary system because there is no longer any market-based self-correcting mechanism for increasing debt increasing the money supply and increasing leverage in any system, any physical system, any social system, any system without a self-correcting mechanism blows up. And with no exceptions, the history of legal tender irredeemable paper ticket money is that its purchasing power always approaches its cost of production, which is zero. Now, I want to explain why the system is dishonest. 
There are myriad misrepresentations and non-disclosure of material information about what we call a dollar. No amount of regulation or oversight committees will cure dishonesty. The only remedy is honesty. To illustrate what, in my view, is the most egregious example of this dishonesty, I give an example of silver, although the same principle applies with gold. Now, it was and remains inconvenient for people to carry around silver dollars because they're heavy and bulky. And so what people did, let's have that first exhibit up there. Okay. What people did is that they deposited their silver dollars, typically in a bank, and received in exchange a promissory note, a.k.a. a bank note or a note, that bore the inscription that so many dollars have been deposited and the note is payable to the, man, payable to the bearer rather, on demand. So here's an example of a United States note. And notice that this is not a dollar. At the top of the bill are the words United States Note, and I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but under the image it says, we'll pay to the bearer on demand one dollar. Well, what is a dollar? Next slide, please. That's the dollar as put into law by Alexander Hamilton in the Coinage Act of 1792. But then, the promise to pay a dollar, let's have the next slide. The promise to pay a dollar was defaulted, and here's the punchline. The broken promissory note. The dishonored promissory note is now represented as being a dollar. This is a gross misrepresentation and is dishonest. This piece of paper is not even a valid note. The signatures of the Treasury of the United States and the Secretary of the Treasury are gratuitous and deceptive. In other words, what we use for money is just dishonest promissory notes and that they're misrepresented to be dollars. It means that all of the securities in our capital markets at home and abroad are denominated in dishonored promissory notes. This has immense implications for trade, jobs, pensions, military preparedness, and almost everything else that's important. Now, people have the notion that the Congress can make the dollar anything the Congress wants it to be and back it with specie or not or whatever. This is demonstrably false. The highest law in our country is the Constitution, and all of our laws have to be in conformity with it. The word dollar is mentioned twice in the Constitution, but it is not defined in the Constitution. It's mentioned in connection with the slave tax, which is no more, but it's also mentioned, and very importantly, in the Seventh Amendment, which guarantees everyone a right to a trial by jury for any dispute, $20 or more. Now, if it were true that the Congress could redefine the dollar, that would mean that the Congress could redefine the Seventh Amendment, which is ridiculous. And so the question comes up, what is the objective meaning of the dollar? And in fact, for the Seventh Amendment to have objective meaning, the dollar has to have an objective meaning. And what they're talking about in the Constitution, let's have the next slide, is the Spanish mill dollar, uh, sometimes called the piece of eight. The Spanish had built mints all over the colonies, and the Spanish mill dollar was ubiquitous. And when independence was declared, the colonies adopted the Articles of Confederation, which gave the Congress the power to issue money called Continentals. Here's an example of a Continental $30 bill. Next slide, please. Uh, notice it entitles, I don't know if you can read it from where you're sitting. Notice it entitles the bearer to receive 30 Spanish mill dollars or the value thereof in gold and silver. The value of a coin is its specie content. After independence was achieved and the Constitution was adopted, the United States did not want to rely on Spanish mints for its coins. The U.S. wanted its own mints to mint its own coins, including dollars. To that end, Alexander Hamilton, then Secretary of the Treasury, wrote the Coinage Act of 1792, wherein he tells us exactly what a dollar is. And what a dollar is is 371.25 grains of silver. Where did Hamilton get that crazy number? Well, that's what, that was the silver content of the Spanish mill dollar. So they couldn't just introduce some arbitrary coin because everybody had contracts in terms of dollars. So the Constitution requires that the dollar be a weight of silver. Now, some might claim that if Hamilton defined the dollar this way, perhaps it can be defined another way. And that is not true either. Hamilton's definition of a dollar was not arbitrary. All he did was write into law what was already a fact. Now, here's another way of looking at this issue. Go to the next slide, please. Suppose we have a sign that says cat. Next slide. And we hang it on a dog. Next slide. Does the dog become a cat? And suppose the Congress passes a law that says all the dogs with cat signs, with the cat signs are now cats. Go to the next slide. Now are all these dogs cats? And the answer is no. 
And conceptually, this is no different than, take, than taking a piece of paper, printing the word dollar on it, adding seals and signatures, and calling it a dollar. And this is precisely what has happened to our money. Clearly, there is no easy remedy. How could such an immense fraud be perpetrated? Well, there are several reasons, but one of the most important, which H.R. 1098 will go a long way to correcting, is that we're coerced to using fraudulent money by the legal tender statutes. By getting rid of legal tender, H.R. 1098 is necessary and may be sufficient to help pave the way to an honest monetary system. I'm going to stop now and give you a chance to address any uh, questions or issues that may come to mind. Thank you so much. I, I thank you. I'd like to go next to uh, Dr. White. Uh, Dr. Lawrence White is professor of economics at George Mason University, where he specializes in the theory and history of banking and money. Dr. White has written extensively on monetary systems with over 40 articles published in academic journals, including the American Economic Review and the Journal of Monetary Economics. He has also authored three books on monetary matters, including competition and currency. He received his PhD in economics from UCLA and his undergraduate in economics from Harvard. And Dr. White, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss my views on H.R. 1098, the Free Competition and Currency Act of 2011. I'm going to have to be very sweeping given the limited time, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about historical or other details. The idea of competition in currency, or you might call it competition among currencies, uh, is fairly straightforward. We know as a rule that open competition gives us better products, higher quality at lower cost. For example, we have faster and more reliable package delivery thanks to the competition of FedEx and United Parcel Service with the U.S. Postal Service. The main point I want to emphasize today is that competition in currency isn't any exception to this general rule. More competition promotes better currency. Let me give you some examples. Throughout her, uh, history, currency has been better provided by freely competing uh, private enterprises than by government monopoly or by legally protected private monopoly. Uh, the U.S. had competing gold and silver mints at one time during our gold and silver rushes, and they produced very trustworthy coins. These private mints uh, ended only when they were suppressed by Civil War legislation, part of which H.R. 1098 aims to repeal. Uh, redeemable private tokens and redeemable bank-issued paper currency notes have also been popular forms of money in the 60-plus parts of the world where they've been allowed. H.R. 1098 would lift legal barriers to currency competition. It wouldn't immediately remove the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve System from issuing currency. But, and this is the second point I want to emphasize, Competition would give the Fed better incentives, better incentives to provide the kind of money that people want, sound money, stable valued money, trustworthy money. It would give the Fed better incentives to avoid creating inflation, in other words, because its customers could begin to go elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. dollar already faces competition, and I would say useful competition, in the international arena. Right? People have a choice in the international trade. Uh, between the dollar and the euro, the Swiss franc, and they can invest in gold and silver. So there are many monetary standards in the world. H.R. 1098 would open the door to similar kinds of competition within the domestic arena, between Federal Reserve notes and other currencies. Uh, it won't make the Federal Reserve note go away, as Dr. Paul said, if people want to use Federal Reserve notes. New forms of currency won't gain a foothold in the market any faster than the public has reason to prefer them to Federal Reserve notes. So the Fed can retain its business as long as it provides a high-quality product. But if the Fed slips up in quality control, meaning if double-digit inflation should unfortunately return to the United States, then the American public would find it very useful to have trustworthy alternatives uh, to Federal Reserve notes that are depreciating in their pockets. So this act uh, offers three concrete reforms, and let me talk about them briefly. Section 2 of the act removes legal tender status from Treasury coins and Federal Reserve notes. Legal tender is, has a more narrow scope than is often uh, realized. It relates to the discharge of debts. So the phrase on Federal Reserve notes, legal tender for all debts, means that under current law, 
a creditor is barred from refusing payment in Federal Reserve notes. But it's perfectly feasible to have debt contracts without legal tender. And in fact, there's already an important class of contracts that are today exempt from legal tender provisions. Under Title 31, Section 5118D2, the obligations created by gold clause bonds uh, are not discharged by delivery of legal tender today. Right? That section says the bond issuer has a uh, contractual obligation to pay in gold. Uh, that's what the contract says, and that will be enforced. So removing legal tender status from U.S. Treasury coins and Federal Reserve notes more generally would simply broaden the freedom to denominate debt contracts in whatever people want, not just dollars, not just gold, but they might want silver. They might want to say the debt is only discharged by checks or wire transfers of dollars, or it could be silver coins, or it could be units of foreign currency, claims denominated in consumer index bundles, or wholesale commodity bundles, uh, or it could be bitcoins. Section 3 of the Act rules out federal or state taxes on precious metal coins, uh, whether minted by a foreign government or by a private firm. That would allow a more level playing field for competition uh, of private coins with the U.S. Treasury coins without the special tax disadvantages, which now handicap uh, private coins. Sales taxes on acquisition, capital gains taxes on holding them. Right? Federal Reserve notes are not subject to those taxes. Uh, Section 4 of the Act repeals Title 18, Section 486. That section bans privately produced gold, uh, sorry, privately produced coins of gold, silver, or other metals. Uh, and it repeals Section 489, which bans disks that are merely similar to official coins. 486 uh, is the relic of the Civil War that I mentioned. It was part of an effort to boost the acceptance of the wartime paper greenbacks by banning competition from the private gold coins that were being produced. Repealing that would al again allow producers to make and consumers th uh, the option to use privately minted silver and gold coins if they like. Uh, I think the question we should ask, uh, in the words of Seth Lipsky in a recent Wall Street Journal article, uh, is whether it makes any sense to, quote, suppress private money that is sound in order to protect government-issued money that is unsound, unquote. Uh, I mentioned that Section 489 would also be repealed. That, I think, is a section that's redundant at best and far too sweeping at worst. It outlaws making or possessing, quote, any token disk or device in the likeness or similitude as to design, color, or the inscription thereon of any of the coins of the United States. It's redundant at best because there's already another section that outlaws counterfeiting. And we're not talking about repealing the laws against counterfeiting. But this section is simply about similitude. And if you took it literally, it would outlaw all silver medallions because, after all, they are the same color as silver dollars and quarters and dimes. So, it's too sweeping because it can be used to suppress private coinage, what we might say victimless private coinage, uh, that doesn't involve counterfeiting and doesn't involve any other fraudulent intent. Uh, so to conclude, competition in currency is a very practical idea. It's an idea that offers sizable benefits to the public when the quality of the dominant currency becomes doubtful. Now, we all hope that Federal Reserve notes retain their value, but for those who are skeptical, they should have another uh, alternative. U.S. citizens would benefit from H.R. 1098's removal of current legal restrictions and obstacles against currencies that could provide useful competition with Federal Reserve notes and Treasury coins. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll start off with uh, the questions. The first question will be for both of you. What do you think the uh, arguments will be by the establishment? How will they come back and describe what we're trying to do? And uh, why, why is it, uh, well, I think it's well known that uh, governments have always wanted to cling to a monopoly power over the currency. And it must be related to that. But could you give me an idea what you think they will be saying or uh, trying to describe What's, ha what's going to happen, and if they claim that this would be terribly chaotic, what are some of the answers that we might give to those questions that they raise? Well, I, I suspect that the, the 
argument might be made that you're encouraging people to uh, abandon the U.S. dollar and thereby you're undermining the U.S. economy. Right? But the, the answer is that the fate of the dollar, the purchasing power of the dollar, is in the Federal Reserve's hands. And all we're doing is giving people the option to make the transition to a more stable system if the Federal Reserve note should begin to deteriorate uh, in value and reliability. If we look at the experience around the world with paper money, we know that high inflation is not impossible. And we've had double-digit inflation in the U.S. And in, where people are free, they start in a country with very high inflation. In Latin America, we see this many times. They prefer to start moving their savings uh, into a more stable currency. And then they start posting prices in the more stable currency so that they don't have to repost them every day. Uh, and then they start accepting payment in the more stable currency. So having that freedom makes the public a lot better off. So giving people an additional option uh, doesn't undermine the stability of the current monetary system. That's under the control of the people who issue the current money. Dr. Park. What I suspect uh, they're going to do is to ignore this altogether, not raise any objections at all, just to leave it alone. Uh, however, should any objections come forth, I think the best response is that the irredeemable paper ticket money is going away. And in fact, the history of the world is that these paper monies always go away. Why should this one be any different? Uh, secondly, the dollar is lost since the dollar. The irredeemable paper ticket dollar has lost something like 98% of its purchasing power since the Federal Reserve was formed. Why does anybody think that the last 2% is sacrosanct? Thirdly, there's a whole bunch of, um, how shall I say, uh, trial balloons being uh, pushed forth by the media talking about currency depreciation and why it's acceptable. So there's a time roughly about a year and a half ago when Jeffrey Garton uh, Jeffrey Garton had a minor role in the Nixon administration, was an undersecretary of, I think, commerce in the Clinton administration, went on to be dean of the management school at Yale University, wrote five books, sometimes uh, a publisher of uh, articles in Business Week, member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So he publishes an article in the Financial Times, something to the effect, we have to get ready for a week a dollar, and he says in the Financial Times, the United States is going to have to camouflage a slow motion default, camouflage, in other words, uh, not really explain to the people what they're doing, but there's no question at all that the obligations of this government, of, of all the local and state governments, and all the other debts, these obligations are not going to be met. People's pensions are going to be lost. Then this was followed up just recently by a, a professor from uh, Harvard, uh, Professor Rugoff, uh, who published a piece saying that once every 75 years or so, we have to have extra inflation, maybe 6 7% in order to get rid of this debt. And this was legitimatized further by Floyd Norris, a senior writer from the New York Times, very senior guy. Uh, he wrote an article, Sometimes Inflation is Not Evil. So what they're really doing is setting us up for the depreciation of the dollar. And we know from history that once this gets started, uh, once this gets out of the can, there's no way to put it back in the can. Um, other things about this competition in money, well, it's true that you can make contracts in gold. However, in regular life, if you should have a contractual dispute with somebody and it gets settled in the courts, that judgment is going to come down in the irredeemable paper ticket money. And also, it's also noteworthy that the uh, people in the financial sector have gotten the International Monetary Fund in 1978 to add a provision to the Articles of Agreements, like their bylaws, to prohibit member countries from linking their currencies to gold and only to gold. I mean, these folks have really knocked themselves out to get gold out of the monetary structure. And I think part of the response should be that um, the reason they did that is so that they could garner uh, 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 unearned profits. I have good evidence to show that. I think I'm past my time. I don't know if you want to see some of that evidence. I'm asking you a question. Shall I put it up? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah put, up, um, um, put up slide number 57, please. I'm sorry, uh, 56. 56. Do you have that? That's not it. Well, why don't we? Um, 
I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's, uh, let's just postpone that and come back to it. We'll have time to come back to it. Okay. 63. Okay. I'd like to... Back, so if you go back to 1980, there you go. The money supply in this country, defined by the uh, Federal Reserve at that time, was M3, was something on the order of $2 trillion. And the market capitalization of the stock market was roughly a trillion. The financial sector portion of that was roughly 5%, roughly $50 billion. You zip ahead to 2007. Now, all created flat out of nothing, with no work. Now the money supply is something on the order of $13 trillion. The stock market capitalization is approaching $20 trillion. And now the value of the financial sector firms is something like $4 trillion. Went from $50 billion to $4 trillion. Forget about the bonuses. Think stock options. And I mean, these folks have garnered just an incredible amount of money. They don't even know what to do with it. That would not have been possible if we had an honest monetary structure. And the way they got away from the monetary structure, honest monetary structure is they got gold out of the system. And uh, the legal tender laws helped do that. So really, you have to get rid of legal tender. Okay, thank you. I want to move on. I, I want to uh, yield time to uh, the vice chairman of the committee, the gentleman from... Uh, North Carolina, Walter Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Parks and Dr. White, thank you very much for your testimony today. And I'm going to take a little different approach. I am not an expert in financial matters uh, of this uh, monetary, but I've learned a lot from my good friend Ron Paul and being part of the Liberty Caucus. And it has uh, at least exposed me to some, some uh, individuals like yourself that could help me become more interested in the issue of monetary policy. I am one that uh, very much concerned, as most Americans are, that we are headed down a road of no return. And when I listen to your testimonies both, and I listen very carefully, it brings me to a, a question that the average working American, which I'm part of that group, by the way, um, when do we know that we get to a monetary point of no return? Is that, when that collapse comes, is that something, in your opinion, that you see happening sooner rather than later? And what should the average person what will make the average person realize that we're in a collapse as it relates to the strength of the dollar? Well, I think we're uh, getting mixed messages right now. If we look at the exchange value of the U.S. dollar, it's declined precipitously the last couple of years. If we look at the price of gold, of course, that's shooting through the roof. And those are telling us that people don't want to hold their wealth in dollars they want to move it into something they think is safer. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, inflation index bonds, or if you look at long-term bonds, those are not signaling the expectation of high inflation. But I'm not sure how much we can trust those signals anymore, because the Federal Reserve now has a policy of buying 30-year bonds to drive their prices up and drive their yields down. So that signal may be jammed a little bit. But when we see all those signals indicating that high inflation is coming, uh, then we know we have a, a big problem on our hands. And of course, we don't just have a monetary problem. We also have a fiscal problem. Sure. We have a, a problem of uh, an unsustainable uh, debt going forward. And the two issues are, of course, related. As uh, Dr. Parks mentioned, uh, there's been talk about how we need inflation in order to relieve our fiscal, uh, our national debt in real terms. But uh, that's nothing more than a default sort of behind a, a very thin veil uh, in the form of the value of the dollars being paid back is reduced by half instead of the debt is clearly cut, in, uh, explicitly cut in half. But it's the same thing. Uh, so when that becomes sort of respectable talk, then we have to be very worried. Uh, you, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can identify a, you know, exactly a tipping point, but when we see uh, inflation get into double digits, then we'll know uh, we're in big trouble. I would say that 
uh, collapse can come at any moment. And the amount of leverage in the system uh, is beyond belief. Put up the slide number 71, please. Uh, this is a slide showing the amount of derivative bets that banks have made all over the planet. It's something north of $600 trillion. That's 71. And uh, where this data comes from, the Bank for International Settlements, which is sort of like an umbrella organization for all the central banks, it has sovereignty, by the way. But one of the things it does is they calculate all these derivative bets. Uh, that's um, site 71. That's not it. There you go. So after the last tie to gold was broken, which was in 1971, as you can see from this chart, basically the only derivative bets you had were things like in commodities, corn, soybeans, or whatever. But after the last tie to gold was broken, you started to have volatility in interest rates, big volatility, and big volatility in foreign exchange rates. And people who are in business and people who trade in, uh, between countries need to hedge that. And now the banks have made an incredible number of bets on this. According to the Bank for International Settlements, the amount at risk that can be lost is something like $30, $40 trillion. $30, $40 trillion. And this is worldwide. In this country, according to the Office of the Control of the Con Currency, the amount of derivative bets is something in the order of $200 trillion. And of that, uh, one bank, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, has something like $80 trillion worth of derivative bets. Uh, these, these bets, by the way, uh, you have counterparty risk. And that's what happened with AIG. That's why they really had to bail AIG. AIG owed money to a bunch of banks. If you let AIG go down, then those bank balance sheets become impaired. But also, in this business of inflation, they have changed the methodology of how they compute the CPI multiple times since the Clinton years. Put up uh, slide 27, please. There's a guy who's a scholar for us. His name is John Williams. Uh, he's in retirement now. He used to be an establishment uh, economist with clients like Boeing and IBM. And what he does is he calculates the CPI using the consistent methodology from the 1980s. That's that top blue line versus what the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us today. And as you can see, uh, on, a, on a consistent methodology basis, uh, inflation is already and has been running 10, 11 percent for like 25 years. The understatement of, uh, uh, of the CPI, these are innovations such as the hedonic pricing, geometric weighting, substitution. Who knows what these people are talking about? They really lull people into thinking, well, it's not as bad as it is. Uh, I prepared an analysis. Uh, go to chart number 28, please. These are my uh, health care premiums for Oxford while I had Oxford. And I compare the year-on-year -year increases, slide 29, with the medical component of the CPI. Let's have the next slide, please. With the medical component of the CPI and my uh, insurance premiums, this is everybody in the whole country, they're going up 15% a year, but the medical component of the CPI is going up 4% a year. So they mislead people on that. And of course, people who are seniors who get Social Security, those benefits are key to the CPI, uh, disabled veterans, um, uh, people who have cost of living uh, uh, escalations and union contracts, and of course holders of uh, Treasury inflation protection bonds, these people are all being cheated. But the tipping point comes, you don't know how it is, because of the leverage. It's the leverage that always brings you down, and the leverage is beyond belief. And like I say, it can happen while I'm talking here. You don't know what it's going to be. Thank you, Chairman. No, I, I, I'm going to stay for another question. Then I got it. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions as, uh, I'd like to ask. Um, i start with uh, Dr. White. Um, you know, we've had this uh, system of money since 1971 where there's uh, no connection to gold and the dollar has been used as a reserve currency. Like, slightly less degree now than it was, you know, even a year ago, but it's still the major reserve currency. And uh, most of the countries hold hold dollars and then they uh, pyramid their debt and inflate their own currencies from this. Has there been many times in history that it's been this uh, significant, this big, this worldwide with a fiat currencies? I know we've had fiat currencies, uh, you know, for as long as we can date. I mean, people have, have debased the currency in different manners. But has it ever been this big? Is this a special phenomenon or is this something that you can go back in history and say, well, it was sort of like this uh, 200 years ago or 300 years ago, and, and we worked our way out of it. How do you put this in perspective uh, in history? 
Well, as far as the international monetary system goes, the international monetary system was never a fiat system. It was the international silver standard and the international gold standard. And, of course, there's no potential for runaway inflation when you have a metallic currency. It's only mined to 1%, 2% of this stock is produced each year. Uh, the stock of gold just doesn't grow that fast. And, in fact, that makes it possible to have an international monetary system. It's not controlled by any one country. And so countries can join knowing that it's safe from uh, political uh, devaluation, from the interests of any one country undermining the system. Uh, countries that have adopted the dollar or who fix their own exchange rate to the dollar uh, do so when they think the dollar is the most popular currency in world markets, but uh, as you mentioned, as the dollar becomes a little shakier, they start to shy away. And there's China, most importantly, has moved from basing their currency entirely on the dollar to now a basket of, of currencies. So we're starting to see uh, other countries starting to back away from the dollar. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, the, the move to the uh, create the European monetary system, provide some real competition to the dollar as an international reserve currency. And we can only hope that that will give the Fed a signal that there's somebody they don't want to inflate faster than. Of course, it seems to be a race to the bottom right now. Uh, if we were successful and had something like we're proposing and we had a competing currency, what would happen with the concept of fractional reserve banking? Would that uh, would more laws have to be written, or uh, would they follow the same pattern that we have today? How, how how do you think that would work? That's a very good question. I'm if uh, private gold and silver coins begin to be popular, people are going to want to have bank services denominated in gold units or silver units whatever it is that, that they find attractive. And we, I'm not sure we really have uh, a sort of legal barrier against the Fed controlling that parallel banking system the way they control the current banking system. So it might be necessary to construct some barriers and say, uh, here are the rules for this parallel banking system. It, it doesn't have deposit insurance. It doesn't have control by the Federal Reserve System. Uh, as to reserve ratios or investment portfolios. Mm -hmm. So we would need to think about that if we got to the point where there was a big demand for those services. I might follow up on that and ask both of you uh, what your opinion is of fraction reserve banking. You know, uh, in the free market circles, there's a disagreement, you know, to, to, to a large degree on, uh, I know uh, Rothbard was very adamant to uh, his position of uh, no fraction reserve banking. But, what, what, what is your opinion about what would be proper, and then Larry, you can ask answer as well, about uh, whether we sh should have rules on what the banks uh, declare? Well, I think the basic rule should be freedom of contract, and as long as people make informed fractional reserve contracts with their banker, I have no problem with that. And historically, that seems to have been what was more popular. If you have a fractional reserve, then you don't need to pay storage fees to the vault keeper who's keeping your gold, and you may even get interest uh, on your account balance. So it's an attractive deal. It doesn't have to be based on hoodwinking the customers. Customers brought their money to fractional reserve banks because they got a better deal. Uh, the other thing worth noting is that you can't really have circulating paper currency, which is more convenient than carrying around coins for many purposes, unless you have fractional reserve banking. Because if it was a warehouse receipt, the warehouse needs to know who to charge the storage fees to. But if it's an anonymous circulating note like we're accustomed to, how do they know who to charge the storage fees to? So I don't know of any historical examples of circulating warehouse receipts, uh, but there are plenty of examples of pay to the bearer on demand uh, in gold or silver circulating banknotes. Do you have an opinion on fraction reserve banking? Uh, first, uh, first question, uh, put up uh, slide number 73. This has to do with the size the amount of uh, uh, fiat money out there. Uh, slide 73, please. This is a uh, uh, analysis that's put together by McKinsey Global, and in 1980, the amount of uh, financial securities was roughly, I don't know, it looks like around 18 trillion. 
By the end of 2009, it was close to 200 trillion. Uh, uh, last year, it hit something like 212 trillion. Now, I don't know if you can see on that chart, but at the very top, it's in red, and that's gold. So all the rest is in irre it's, it's irredeemable paper ticket money, uh, U.S. and foreign money, or securities denominated in irredeemable paper ticket money. The nice thing about this bill is that it leaves everything in place, it leaves the dollar in place, it leaves the Federal Reserve in place, and it really facilitates a transition. And for everyday purposes, it really doesn't make any difference to people whether they use an irredeemable paper ticket, a token, or whatever. Uh, they go to work, they uh, get paid, they buy stuff, who cares? Where it comes, becomes important is for future payment, for people's pensions, for people's annuities, for people's savings. And there they want to know in the future that they're going to have what they have. And so in that way, this bill is very important for future transactions. Uh, people will want gold. And we have precedent in this country where this kind of thing was instituted, and that was after the Civil War. You recall the Civil War was financed with greenbacks. At one point, uh, the greenbacks were discounted roughly 50% against gold. And the way people looked to protect themselves afterwards is they put a gold clause in their contracts. So when they got paid later on, they got the same amount of gold they were expecting. When the United States issued liberty bonds in the First World War, they had a gold clause in the bonds. Now, as the fraction reserve lending, uh, I agree with Dr. White, uh, but I want to add something to that. And that is the uh, fraction reserve lending that got us into trouble uh, from the get-go. And the reason is the banks have um, engaged in fraud in their basic banking relationships right from the beginning. And so, for example, banks told people that they were depositors. They're not depositors. They're unsecured creditors. And secondly, people told people they could get their money back on demand. Well, in fact, in the law, when these people put money into a bank, it's not their money anymore. It's the bank's money to do which, with as the bank wishes. Um, if banks want to do fractional reserve lending, they need to do what I call full disclosure. They have to tell people right out, uh, we're going to lend this money to somebody else or whatever, that you may not be able to get it back. Uh, some people may want to take that gamble, but my guess is they won't. Uh, ordinary people put money in the bank for security, for safety. They don't want to have it in the mattress. They want it, it might be stolen or be lost or whatever. Uh, they're not interested in making interest on their, uh, on their savings. They just want it to be safe. Uh, those people are not going to be involved in fractional reserve lending. Um, as to uh, uh, Murray Rothbard's uh, point of view, uh, Murray was talking always about a gold-backed dollar. That is a mistake. And again, you have to go back to what a dollar is. A dollar is a weight of silver. There's no such thing as a gold-backed piece of silver. Um, and uh, the trouble with what Murray did is uh, he didn't go back further than the Coinage Act of 1792, where Hamilton defined the dollar as 371.25 grains of silver. The notion was that if Hamilton could define the dollar one way, we can define it another way. That is not true. But again, the beauty of this uh, H.R. 1098 bill is that we don't really have to address those issues. Uh, I think what will happen is that for long-term transactions, people will start using the gold clause, and over time, there'll be a transition. During that period, all the irredeemable paper ticket money will go away. The Federal Reserve will go away. Uh, again, there's no possibility, in my view, as a practical matter of uh, having some kind of discontinuity in our monetary system, getting rid of the Fed. But this uh, effect is really important, and we need to bring people up to curve on why it is. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I um, want to uh, go a little bit off your expertise, but I think you will have uh, some very uh, helpful comments. I've uh, said two of my, the worst votes I've ever made since I've been in Congress. One was the vote to go into Iraq, and the second one was the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Now, I realize this doesn't deal exactly with monetary issues, but we do have banks. You've made reference to banks uh, many times in your comments about monetary policy. Do you feel that when Glass-Steagall was repealed by the, by the Congress, that it, it helped the banking world or created opportunities for greed and for mistakes. Dr. White, start with you and Dr. Parks. 
Well, uh, greed is part of the human condition. Glass Steagall did not do anything to change that. Uh, there's a fellow, his name is, um, um, his last name was Warburg, who was the son of uh, Paul Warburg. What was his name? Remember? It was one of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's advisors, and he wrote a book in the 1930s it was called The Money Muddle, uh, which really led to this business with Glass Steagall. And what they were complaining about in those days was using bank money in the security for uh, uh, speculate in the securities market. Bank money, it was understood, was money that the bank create, created out of nothing, um, as opposed to regular money, gold and silver. Uh, and so the purpose of Glass-Steagall was really to keep the banks from over-leveraging. And when Glass-Steagall uh, was passed, now the banks could over-leverage in a big way. Uh, I have charts that can put them up to you. It shows you what happened to the banks. Let me just get that out. Um, Start with uh, chart number 67, please, and we'll go right right to them. So if you go before the last tie to gold was broken, uh, look at bank revenues. I mean, they're tiny. What are banks doing? They're, they're uh, processing payments. They're uh, handling the check clearing system. But after the uh, last tie to gold was broken, uh, look what happened to bank revenues. Went up to something like 800 plus billion dollars. This is just the passing paper ad. And go to the next slide and look at bank net income after the last tie to gold was broken. Went up to something like 100 and, I don't know, 130 uh, billion dollars at its peak. I mean, this is after paying compensation to employees. Go to slide 70, please. Look what happens to bank employee compensation. So the whole notion of all this business of allowing the banks to leverage up, this was enormously beneficial to employees, to the banks themselves. Uh, over the period after the last tie to gold was broken, banks paid out over a trillion dollars in dividends. A trillion dollars in dividends. And just a couple of years ago, it turns out, well, our balance sheets are no good. They had to get, I don't know, two trillion dollars from the Federal Reserve. I mean, all this money that they paid out in bonuses and whatnot, this was not real profit. And the only reason they were able to do that is because they were able to leverage up. And the only reason they were able to leverage up is because they have irredeemable paper ticket electronic money, legal tender. If you had gold and silver money, you'd be back on that curve before the, uh, before the last price of gold was broken. And it's the banks that really have corrupted the system. But again, it's probably uh, counterproductive to uh, uh, point fingers. Really what we want to do is have a transition. And again, the whole system is going to collapse no matter what. Uh, it's, it's urgent that we pass this bill in order to facilitate a transition to an honest monetary structure. I understand. Dr. White, yeah. would you comment on Glass-Steagall as well? I would say the repeal of Glass-Steagall had very little to do with the financial crisis. The problem, I, and there would be absolutely no objection to repealing Glass-Steagall, that is letting commercial banks uh, align or merge with investment banks and insurance companies if it weren't for deposit insurance and if it weren't for the too big to fail doctrine. If those had not been in place, then somebody wants to form a financial supermarket, okay, we'll see if that will fly. Uh, it's no skin off our nose. But when we begin to guarantee the liabilities of investment banks, which are highly leveraged, which are not like commercial banks, which are not even part of the payment system, that's really an invitation to trouble. And when the Federal Reserve Bank of New York intervened in the Bear Stearns uh, failure and took up the bad assets so that J.P. Morgan Chase would buy the rest, uh, it's not the first sort of too big to fail action, but it's the one that uh, sort of sticks in my craw. I mean, that, that was really a bad policy. Right. And I don't think it had that much to do with the repeal of Glass-Steagall, but if we treat investment banks like they're entitled to too big to fail protection, then we're really asking for trouble, and that's really what needs to be undone. Thank you, sir. Can I, can I add to that, please? You know, if you have uh, uh, gold and silver as money, gold as money, the too big to fail stuff doesn't even come up. The only reason you have this is because of the irredeemable paper ticket money. Uh, you could never have this kind of leverage with gold. And in fact, the uh, money center banks, they have leveraged their balance sheet something like 30 to 1 impossible if you had an honest monetary system. So uh, it really one feeds into the other. And this whole business was too big to fail, the lender of last resort, federal deposit insurance. But federal deposit insurance is not insurance. It's just a subsidy for the bank. And the reason it came about is that after the 
banks failed in 1933, they were failing before 1933, people were not putting their money back into the banks. And so they passed that legislation to induce people to uh, uh, put their money back into the banks. As far as the lender of last resort comes about, again, that's the result of bank leverage. And the only reason you have so much leverage with the banks is because they misrepresent the deposit. So if I were to borrow money from you, and I want you to lend me $10,000, what's the first thing that goes to your mind? And I would think, how, how, what's the collateral? How am I going to get the money back? What are you going to do with the money? But if you went to a bank and, and they say, well, this is a deposit, now you don't do the counterparty surveillance. So it's really a, a function of what constitutes the money. And I think you have to go back and realize that the, what we call our money today, our dollar, this is just a dishonest promissory note. And in fact, one of the quotes I have for you, and I'll stop right here, is after uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, closed the banks in uh, March uh, 5, 1933, a lot of people were caught short. And there was a question whether they should uh, print script. And here's a quote from uh, uh, William Wooden, uh, then Roosevelt, Secretary of the Treasury. He says, the Federal, the Federal Reserve Act lets us print all we need, and it won't frighten the people. Get this line now. It'll look like state, it will look like stage money. It'll be money that looks like real money. This is the Secretary of the Treasury telling you that this stuff is really, in effect, stage money, but it looks like real money. This is not real money that we have, folks. This is, this is just a piece, piece of paper, dusted up with seals and whatnot. It is dishonest. And we need to fix the dishonesty. Thank you. I have um, one more question uh, for Dr. White. If we moved in to a period of time where we had competing currency, we have one group of people thinking a dollar equals the Federal Reserve notes, and let's say we or somebody decides that uh, a dollar equals 371 grains of silver, and we use an old silver dollar, that could be competing, but the definitions are obviously completely different. How do you think it would be resolved when it comes to uh, paying your taxes? Because they won't, they won't allow, I think this is part of the reason there will be a lot of resistance because they'll think, because people, some people have tried this, you know, paying salaries uh, with, with old silver dollars and, oh, that's a dollar, you know, I'm not, I don't have to pay any taxes on this. So, uh, but it's a real problem because if they think that anybody, I mean, we, we want, uh, you know, to get rid of some of the, uh, inhibitions to competing currency, but if, if the people who use silver dollars had no taxes to pay, it would be a tremendous advantage. I think we could win that argument. But what do you think the IRS and the tax people are going to say about this? And do you have an idea how that could be resolved? Well, I'm sure the uh, IRS would like the taxes to be uh, paid in the equivalent of what they would be if all the transactions had been done in Federal Reserve notes. Um, it would be an interesting exercise to look at uh, around the world and see if there are other countries that uh, have faced this problem of having taxes denominated in multiple currencies. I, I really don't know that much about it myself, but it, it seems like not a very uh, important problem. I mean, on tax day, you need to have some exchange rate uh, between the different currencies people might be allowed to pay in, or you require them to convert their own books into whatever the uh, official currency for tax purposes is. But 364 days of the year, that, that shouldn't bother them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy with software these days to convert one column of figures into another column of figures. It, it seems like in the computer age we could probably work that out rather well if I made $1 of profit and silver was, uh, you know, $40, maybe uh, it could be worked out. Of course, the more ideal would be uh, not to have the income tax, and we wouldn't have to worry about problems like that. So, okay, and, and Walter has gone. Okay, I think that uh, we'll conclude, and uh, this, this hearing is now adjourned.